Time for Krishna book. <clears throat> this is um, starting volume two. This is the story of the Shamantaka Jewel, chapter one, volume two, chapter one. <clears throat> Glories to Srila Prabhupada. There was a king of the name Satrajit within the jurisdiction of Dwarkadam. He was a great devotee of the sun god who awarded him the benediction of a jewel known as Shamantaka. Because of this Shamantaka jewel, there was a misunderstanding between King Satrajit and the Yadu dynasty. Later on, the matter was settled when Satrajit voluntarily offered Krishna his daughter, Satyabhama, along with the jewel Shamantaka. Not only was Satyabhama married to Krishna on account of the Shamantaka jewel, but Jambavati, the daughter of Jambavan, was also married to Krishna. These two marriages took place before the appearance of Pradumna, as described in the last chapter. How King Satyajit offended the Yadu dynasty and how he later on came to his senses and offered his daughter and the Shamantaka jewel to Krishna is described as follows. <clears throat> Since he was a great devotee of the sun god, King Satrajit gradually entered into a friendly relationship with him. The sun god was much pleased with him and delivered to him an exceptional jewel known as Shamantaka. <clears throat> when this jewel was worn by Satrajit in a locket around his neck, he appeared exactly like an imitation sun god. Putting on this jewel, he would enter the city of Dwarka, and the people would think that the sun god had come into the city to see Krishna. They knew that Krishna, being the supreme personality of Godhead, was sometimes visited by the demigods. So when Satrajit was visiting the city of Dwarka, all the inhabitants, except Krishna, took him to be the sun god himself. Although Satrajit was known to everyone, he could not be recognized because of the dazzling effulgence of the Shamantaka jewel. Once, mistaking him to be the sun god, some of the important citizens of Dwarka immediately went to Krishna to inform him that the sun god had arrived to see him. <clears throat> At that time, Krishna was playing chess. One of the important residents of Dwarka spoke thus, My dear Lord Narayan, you're the supreme personality of Godhead. In your plenary portion of Narayan and Vishnu, you have four hands with different symbols, conch shell, disc, club, and lotus flower. You are actually the owner of everything, but in spite of your being the supreme personality of Godhead Narayan, you have descended in Vrindavan to act as the child of Yasoda Mata, who sometimes used to tie you up with her ropes, and you are celebrated, therefore, by the name Damodar. That Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narayan, as accepted by the citizens of Dwarka, was later on confirmed by the great Mayavadi philo philosophical leader Sankaracharya. By accepting the Lord as impersonal, he did not reject the Lord's personal form. He meant that everything which has form in this material world is subjected to creation, maintenance, and annihilation. But the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayan, does not have a material form subjected to these limitations. In order to convince the less intelligent class of men who take Krishna to be an ordinary human being, Shankaracharya therefore said that God is impersonal. This Impersonality means he's not a person of this material condition. He's a transcendental personality without a material body. The citizens of Dwarka addressed Lord Krishna not only as Damodar, but also as Govinda, which indicates that Krishna is very affectionate to the cows and calves. Just to refer to their intimate connection with Krishna, they addressed him as Yadunandana, He's the son of Vasudev, born in the Yadu dynasty. In this way, the citizens of Dwarka concluded that they were addressing Krishna as the supreme master of the whole universe. 
they addressed Krishna in many different ways, proud of being citizens of Dwarka who could see Krishna daily. When Satrajit was visiting the city of Dwarka, the citizens felt great pride to think that although Krishna was living in Dwarka like an ordinary human being, the demigods were coming to see him. And thus they informed Lord Krishna that the sun god, with his appealing bodily effulgence, was coming to see him. The citizens of Dwarka confirmed that the sun god's coming to Dwarka was not very wonderful because people all over the universe who were searching after the Supreme Personality of Godhead knew that he had appeared in the family of Yadu dynasty and was living in Dwarka as one of the members of that family. Thus the citizens expressed their joy on this occasion. On hearing the statement of his citizens, the all-pervasive personality of Godhead Krishna simply smiled. Being pleased with the citizens of Dwarka, Krishna informed them that the person whom they described as the sun god was actually King Satrajit, who had come to visit Dwarka city to show his opulence in the form of the valuable jewel attained from the sun god. <clears throat> Satrajit, however, did not come to see Krishna. He was instead overwhelmed by the jewel of Shamantaka. He installed the jewel in a temple to be worshipped by Brahmins engaged for the purpose. This is an instance of a less intelligent person worshipping a material thing. In the Bhagavad Gita, it's stated that less intelligent persons, in order to get immediate results from their fruit of activities, worship demigods who are created within this universe. The word materialist means one concerned with gratification of the senses within this material world. Although Krishna later asked for the Shamantaka jewel, King Satrajit did not deliver it to him, but installed the jewel for his own purposes of worship. And who would not worship that jewel? Shamantaka jewel was so beautiful that it was daily producing a large quantity of gold. A quantity of gold is counted by a measurement called a bara, According to Vedic formulas, one bara is equal to 16 pounds of gold. One mound equals 82 pounds. The jewel was producing about 170 pounds of gold every day. Besides that, it's learned from Vedic literature that whatever part of the world this jewel is worshipped, there's no possibility of famine. Not only that, but wherever the jewel is present, there's no possibility of anything inauspicious such as pestilence or disease. <clears throat> Lord Krishna wanted to teach the world that the best of everything should be offered to the ruling chief of the country. King Agusena was the overlord of many dynasties and happened to be the grandfather of Krishna. And Krishna asked Satraja to present the shaman Jaka jewel to King Agusena. Krishna pleaded that the best should be offered to the king. But Satrajit, being a worshipper of the demigods, had become too materialistic and instead of accepting the request of Krishna, thought it wiser to worship the jewel in order to get the 170 pounds of gold every day. Materialistic persons who can achieve such huge quantities of gold every day are not interested in Krishna consciousness. Sometimes, therefore, in order to show special favor, Krishna takes away great accumulations of materialistic wealth from a person and makes them his devotee. But Satrajit refused to abide by the order of Krishna and did not deliver the jewel to him. <clears throat> After this incident, Satrajit's younger brother, in order to display the opulence of the family, took the jewel, put it on his neck, and rode on horseback into the forest, making a show of his material opulence. While the brother of Satrajit, who was known as Prasena, was moving here and there in the forest, a big lion attacked him, killing both him and the horse on which he was riding, and took away the jewel to his cave. The news was received by the gorilla king Jambavan, who then killed the lion in the cave and took away the jewel. Jambavan had been a great devotee of the Lord since the time of Lord Ramachandra. So he did not take the valuable jewel as something he very much needed. He gave it to his young son to play with as a toy. <clears throat> In the city, when Satrajit's younger brother Prasena did not return from the forest with the jewel, 
So Trajit became very upset. He did not know that his brother had been killed by a lion <clears throat> and that the lion had been killed by Jambavan. He was therefore, therefore thinking instead that because Krishna wanted the jewel and had not been delivered to him, Krishna might have therefore taken the jewel away from Prasena by force and killed him. This idea grew into a rumor which was being spread by Satrajit in every part of Dwarka. The false rumor that Krishna had killed Prasena and had taken away the jewel was spread everywhere like wildfire. Krishna did not like to be defamed in that way, and therefore he decided that he would go to the forest, find the Shamantaka jewel, taking with him some of the inhabitants of Dwarka. Along with important men of Dwarka, Krishna went to search out Prasena, the brother of Satrajit, and found him dead, killed by the lion. <clears throat> At the same time, Krishna also found the lion, which had been killed by Jambavan, who was generally called by the name Riksha. It was found the lion had been killed by the hand of Riksha, without the assistance of any weapon. Krishna and the citizens of Dwarka then found in the forest a great tunnel said to be the path to Riksha's house. Krishna knew that the inhabitants of Dwarka would be afraid to enter the tunnel, therefore he asked them to remain outside, and he himself entered the dark tunnel alone to find Riksha, Jambavan. <coughs> After entering the tunnel, Krishna saw that the very valuable jewel known as Shamantaka had been given to the son of Riksha as a toy. And in order to take the jewel from the child, he went there and stood before him. When the nurse, who was taking care of Riksha's child, saw Krishna standing before her, she was afraid, thinking the valuable Shamantaka jewel might be taken away by him. By him. She began to cry loudly out of fear. Hearing the nurse crying, Jambavan appeared on the scene in a very angry mood. Jambavan was actually a great devotee of Lord Krishna. But because he was in an angry mood, he could not recognize his master, thought him to be an ordinary man. This brings to mind the statement of the Bhagavad Gita in which the Lord advises Arjuna to get free from anger, greed, and lust in order to rise up to the spiritual platform. Lust, anger, and greed run parallel in the heart and check one's progress on the spiritual path. Not recognizing his master, Jambavan first challenged him to fight. There was a great fight between Krishna and Jambavan, in which they fought like two opposing vultures. Whenever there's an eatable corpse, the vultures fight heartily over the prey. Krishna and Jambavan, first of all, began fighting with weapons, then with stones, big trees, then hand to hand, until at last they were hitting one another with their fists and the blows were like the striking of thunderbolts. Each was expecting victory over the other, but the fighting continued for days, both in daytime and at night, without stopping. In this way, the fighting continued for 28 days. Although Jambavan was the strongest living entity of that time, practically all the joints of his bodily limbs became slackened, and his strength reduced to practically nil after being constantly struck by the fists of Sri Krishna. Feeling very tired, with perspiration all over his body, Jambavan was astonished. Who was this opponent who was weakening him? Jambavan was quite aware of his own superhuman bodily strength, but when he felt tired from being struck by Krishna, he could understand that Krishna was no one else but his worshipful Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This incident has a special significance for devotees. In the beginning, Jambavan could not understand Krishna because his vision was obscured by material attachment. He was attached to his boy and to the greatly valuable Shamantaka jewel, which he did not want to spare for Krishna. In fact, Krishna came there, he became angry, thinking that he had come to take away the jewel. This is the material position. Although one is very strong in body, that cannot help him understand Krishna. <clears throat> in a sporting attitude, Krishna wanted to engage in a mock fight with his devotee. As we've experienced from the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Supreme Personality of Godhead has all the propensities and instincts of a human being. Sometimes 
In a sportive spirit, he wishes to fight to make a show of bodily strength. And when he does so desire, he selects one of his suitable devotees to give him that pleasure. <coughs> Krishna desired this pleasure of mock fighting with Jambavan. Although Jambavan was a devotee by nature, he was without knowledge of Krishna while giving service to the Lord by his bodily strength. But as soon as Krishna was pleased by the fighting, Jambavan immediately understood that his opponent was none other than the Supreme Lord himself. The conclusion is that he could understand Krishna by his service. Krishna is sometimes satisfied by fighting. Krishna therefore said to Jambavan therefore said to the Lord, My dear Lord, I can now understand who you are. You are the Supreme Personality of Godhead Lord Vishnu, the source of everyone's strength, wealth, reputation, beauty, wisdom, renunciation. The statement of Jambavan's is confirmed in Vedanta Sutra, wherein the Supreme Lord is declared to be the source of everything. Jambavan identified Lord Krishna as the Supreme Personality, Lord Vishnu. My dear Lord, you are the creator of the creators of the universal affairs. This statement is very instructive to the ordinary man who is amazed by the activities of a person with an exceptional brain. The ordinary man is surprised to see the inventions of a great scientist, but the statement of Jambavan confirms that although a scientist may be a creator of many wonderful things, Krishna is the creator of the scientist. He is not only the creator of one scientist, but of millions and trillions all over the universe. Jambavan said further, You are not only creator of the creator, but you are also creator of the material elements which are manipulated by the so-called creators. Scientists utilize the physical elements or laws of material nature and do something wonderful. But actually, such laws and elements are also the creation of Krishna. This is actual scientific understanding. Less intelligent men do not try to understand who created the brain of the scientist, simply satisfied by seeing the wonderful creation or invention of the scientist. Jambavan continued, My dear Lord, the time factor which combines all the physical elements is also your representative. You're the supreme time factor in which all creation takes place is maintained and is finally annihilated. And not only the physical elements and the time factors, but also the persons who manipulate the ingredients and advantages of creation are part and parcel of you. The living entity is not, therefore, an independent creator. By studying all factors in the right perspective, one can see that you are the supreme controller and lord of everything. My dear Lord, I can therefore understand that you are the same Supreme Personality of Godhead whom I worship as Lord Ramachandra. My Lord Ramachandra wanted to construct a bridge over the ocean, and I saw personally how the ocean became agitated simply by my Lord's glancing over it. And when the whole ocean became agitated, the living entities like the whales, alligators, and timingilla fish all became perturbed. The timingilla fish in the ocean can swallow big aquatics like whales in one gulp. In this way, the ocean was forced to give way and allow Ramachandra to cross to the island known as Lanka, now supposed to be Ceylon. This construction of a bridge over the ocean from Cape Comorin to Ceylon is still well known to everyone. After the construction of the bridge, a fire was set all over the kingdom of Ravana. During the fighting with Ravana, each and every part of Ravana's limbs was slashed and cut into pieces by your large arrows, and his head fell to the face of the earth. Now I can understand that you are none other than my lord Ramachandra. No one else has such immense strength. No one else could defeat me in this way. Lord Krishna became satisfied by the prayers and statements of Jambavan, and to mitigate the pains of his body, he began to smear the lotus palm of his hand all over the body of Jambavan. Jambavan, Jambavan at once felt relieved by the fatigue, from the fatigue of the great fight. Lord Krishna then addressed him as King Jambavan, because he and not the lion was actually the king of the forest. With his naked hand, without a weapon, Jambavan had killed the lion. Krishna informed Jambavan that he had come to him 
to ask for the shaman Taka jewel, because since the shaman, ja shaman Taka jewel had been stolen, his name had been defamed by less intelligent. Krishna plainly informed him that he had come there to ask him for the jewel, and in order to be free from the defamation. Jambavan understood the whole situation to satisfy the Lord. He not only immediately delivered the shaman Taka jewel, but he also brought his daughter Jambavati, who was of marriageable age, and presented her to Lord Krishna. The episode of Jambavati's marriage with Krishna and the delivery of the jewel known as Shamantaka was finished within the mountain cave. Although the fighting between Krishna and Jambavan went on for 28 days, the inhabitants of Dwarka waited outside the tunnel for 12 days. After that, they decided something undesirable must have happened. They could not understand what had actually happened for certain, being very sorry and tired, they had returned to the city of Dwarka. All the members of the family, namely the mother of Krishna, Devaki, his father Vasudev, and his chief wife Rukmini, along with all other friends, relatives, and residents of the palace, became very sorry when the citizens returned home without Krishna. Because of their natural affection for Krishna, they began to call Satraja the old names, for he was the cause of Krishna's disappearance. They went to worship the goddess Chandrabhaga, praying for the return of Krishna. The goddess was satisfied by the prayers of the citizens of Dwarka. <coughs> and she immediately offered them her benediction. Simultaneously, Krishna appeared on the scene, accompanied by his new wife, Jambavati. And all the inhabitants of Dwarka and the relatives of Krishna became joyful. The inhabitants of Dwarka became as joyful as someone receiving a dear relative back from the dead. The inhabitants of Dwarka had concluded that Krishna had been put into great difficulties due to the fighting. Therefore, they had become almost hopeless of his return. But when they saw that Krishna had actually returned, not alone but with a new wife, Jambavati, they immediately performed another celebration ceremony. King Ugrasena then called for a meeting of all important kings and chiefs. He also invited Satrajit, and Krishna explained before the whole assembly the incident of the recovery of the jewel from Jambavan. Krishna wanted to return the valuable jewel to King Satrajit. Satrajit, however, became ashamed because he had unnecessarily defamed Krishna. He accepted the jewel in his hand, but he remained silent, bending his head downwards and without speaking anything in the assembly of the kings and chiefs. He returned home with the jewel. Then he thought about how he could clear himself from the abominable action he had performed by defaming Krishna. He was conscious that he had offended Krishna very grievously and that he had to find a remedial measure so that Krishna would again be pleased with him. King Satrajit was eager to get relief from the anxiety he had foolishly created due to being attracted by a material thing, specifically the Shamantaka jewel. Satrajit was truly afflicted by the offense he had committed toward Krishna. He sincerely wanted to rectify it. From within, Krishna gave him good intelligence, and Satrajit decided to hand over to Krishna both the jewel and his beautiful daughter, Satyabhama. There was no alternative for mitigating the situation, Therefore, he arranged for the marriage ceremony of Krishna with his beautiful daughter. He gave in charity both the jewel and his daughter to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Such a Bama was so beautiful and qualified that Satrajit, in spite of being asked for the hand of such a Bama by many princes, was waiting to find a suitable son-in-law. By the grace of Krishna, he decided to hand his daughter over to him. Lord Krishna, being pleased upon Satrajit, informed that he did not have any need of the Shamantaka jewel. It's better to let it remain in the temple as you have kept it, he said, and every one of us will derive benefit from the jewel. Because of the jewel's presence in the city of Dwarka, there will be no more famine and disturbances created by pestilence or excessive heat and cold. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purport of the second volume, first chapter of Krishna. Story of the Shamantaka Jewel.